man, it's your house, Father. And we're here to experience your presence. And your word says that, that we could come to you when we're weary and heavy laden and carry heavy burdens, and you would give us rest. So, man, Father, I pray for each one of us that are here today carrying some kind of burden that, that honestly we were never intended to carry because you said we could bring it to you and you'd give us rest. So I pray we would lay those things down today, whatever they might be, whatever that might look like for each one of us, God. The incredible thing is you know what each one of those things are right now. May we lay those burdens down. May we step into your rest today. Step into your peace. Experience your presence that gives us all those things here today, Jesus. We ask it all in your name. And everybody said, amen. 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 You can be seated this morning. Man, we are so glad to have you here with us today. Listen, if you are a first-time guest, we just want to take a moment and thank you for being here and welcome you. And we just want to take a moment to get a Connect card, get it into your hand so that we can celebrate you being with us today. So if you would slip your hand up now, if you're a first-time guest, our ushers are going to make their way to you. I see a few hands going up on this side over here. Can we welcome our guests this morning? And we are so, so glad to have you here this morning. And then also today in the house is all of our kids because it's faith with family. So all the kids in the house, give me a little like a whoop whoop or something. Come on. There you go. Yes, man. Listen, we love our kids. We love our kids being in church today. Uh, so one, if you hear extra noise coming from kids, that is okay. All right. All right. We're good with that. I will take kids in church any day and all day, every day, all right? That's the sign of God doing something good. Because you want to know what the future of this church is? The kids sitting in this room. Man, we couldn't spend a better thing to invest our time, money, and energy into uh, than kids. So kids, we love you. Thank you for being here today. Um, listen, my name is Jason. I get the privilege of being the executive pastor here, uh, which means I'm the jack of all trades and the master of none. Um, and uh, I'm just kidding. Like, I just do whatever it takes, man. I'm that guy. Um, and so we're excited to get to be here. I'm excited to get to share with you today. Continue to pray for Pastor Robert uh, and his mom uh, and that God would just heal her um, and do an incredible work in her body. And in the meantime, we're going to, to do what God has created us to do uh, and, and what Pastor Robert asked, and that's continue to preach the word and point people to Jesus. Amen. So we're going to get to Romans chapter 12 in just a minute. If you want to turn there, flip there, click there on your Bible, whatever that looks like for you, you're welcome to do any and all of those things. We talked last week, Pastor Robert shared this message uh, about um, having refreshed, fresh thoughts, fresh perspective in our life that, that sometimes we need to recognize that, that we need a new perspective, that the perspective is not just the end goal of where we're trying to get, but it's the journey on the way. In fact, that's what we sang in that song just a second ago, that it wasn't about the arrival, but it's about the journey. And that's part of that fresh perspective that we've been called to have. But another thing I know is that in order to have a fresh perspective, we have to have fresh thoughts. Part of gaining a fresh perspective is gaining a fresh way to think. And, and we, I was texting with a friend uh, this past week. He's a pastor, and he's got little kids, um, and I've got one in college and one that's a junior in high school. So we're kind of on the opposite end of the kid spectrum a little bit. He's got three little ones. And we were texting back and forth, and he said, you mean to tell me it doesn't get easier when our kids get older? I, everybody that's got kids that older, we laugh, right? And all you parents that have littles, you're like, please tell me he's wrong, right? Um, and, but we, we kind of have this broken thought pattern that we think one day it's going to get easier when they get older. Um, listen, uh, as one that's in college and, and another one that's a junior driving, I would take diapers and formula. Uh, I would, going back, I realized diapers and formula aren't nearly as expensive as life is right now. Um, so, <laughs> but we, we kind of have these broken thoughts that we think sometimes and we realize, man, it's, it's not true at all. That, that sometimes we go into marriage with some of those broken thought patterns that we think, man, the, the longer I'm married, it's just going to get easier. <laughs> like, I love that we keep laughing, right? Or, or here's the other one that we do. If we'll just have kids, everything's going to work out in our marriage. I know, it's like, but we all know somebody that said that, and, and sometimes that may have been like us, right? That we have that moment somewhere where maybe you don't have somebody, that you're single and ready to mingle, and you're like, man, if I could just find that one person, then my life is going to be fulfilled, and I'll find everything I need, except 
man, if you're not fulfilled before you find somebody else, you won't be fulfilled when you find somebody else. That we kind of have this thought pattern when it comes to finances that, that, man, if I could just make more money, then it would fix all my money problems. No, it won't. <laughs> because you spend too much money now, you'll spend too much money then. That The problem is not more money, it's what you're doing with it. But we kind of believe this broken thought pattern that somehow if we stay in that broken thought pattern, it's not actually going to fix what we think it's going to do. And I I think in order to step into the fresh perspective that God wants for us this year, it needs to come with a fresh and new way that we think. That we have to understand that so much of what we experience in life and the way we face it and the way that we embrace it, it starts here in our head and in our heart. Because the thoughts that we think become the things that we believe and they become the actions of our life. And so if we want to begin to shape our thoughts around the kingdom of God and shape our life around the kingdom of God, then we've got to get our thoughts where the kingdom of God is at. And that's what Paul is getting at in Romans chapter 12. See, there's this this whole part, Romans 1 through 11, where Paul has been laying the groundwork about what salvation is, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but the gift of God is eternal life. And he goes on and talks about how, how we are saved through Christ by grace, not through our works, but it's a gift of God. And we've been grafted into the family, and we are more than a conqueror, and nothing can separate us from the love of God. And he paints in 11 chapters this beautiful portrait about what salvation is and what it means to us. And then he gets to Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 1. And that's where I want us to pick up. He said, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers. Listen, anytime there is a therefore in scripture, it's there for a reason. Bad dad joke, I know. But trust me, you want to pay attention where there's a therefore in Scripture because it's a transition. It's a point. It's a connection from what I've just talked about to what I'm trying to point out. And what Paul is trying to point out is what it means to live and walk out this thing of salvation that he just spent 11 chapters talking about. And he said, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. See, there's this moment where where he is beginning to tell us what it looks like to walk out this thing, salvation, this thing that we say we believe in. That is this gift from God. And so therefore, we need to pay attention to what follows there. And one of the first things he says is that we ought to be a living sacrifice. That's a new way of thinking about something. Like when I think of the word sacrifice, I don't think of living to describe sacrifice. I think of something dying to describe a sacrifice. They they used to sacrifice animals on an altar and they would die and then they would have to do it again and something else would have to die and over and over again. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful I don't have to sacrifice animals every time I mess up. I don't think I would own enough sheep and goats to cover all of my sins. Um, But if somebody was in the sheep and goat business, they might make a killing off me. Anybody else in that boat? All right, just a few of us. Thank you. There's a few real people in here. Um, The rest, no, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, It's all right. We can laugh. It's all good. But to put living sacrifice together, like, seems crazy to me. But yet, that's exactly what God was saying in that moment. Because our life is meant to be a living sacrifice. It's meant that every day we would lay our life down on the altar and say, God, I'm living for you today. And then the next day we're going to get up and say, God, I'm living for you today. That that it is a living sacrifice. And and sometimes here's what I believe, and I I feel like I need to caveat this a little bit, but but it's easier to die for something than it is to live for something. And and some of you are like, hold on. Like, man, I've known some people that have laid down their life, and I get it. But hear me and hear the context of what I say when I mean that. I think about somebody that's experienced divorce. I have in in my own family between my parents. And there was a moment where it was easier to give into the death of divorce than put in the work it was to keep this thing living and work. That there is a moment somewhere along the way where we experience things. That it's easier to die in our finances and just file for bankruptcy than it is to put into work and figure out how to work all this out. 
that somewhere along the way, it does become easier at times to die to something than try to live for something. And yet Jesus said that we ought to become a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice. That our life ought to be laid down on the altar all day, every day. Sometimes it's multiple times a day. Like, I've got to be honest with you. Like, there are moments for me where it's like in the 40-minute drive here to work, I've got to turn on some worship music because it's happened three or four times when somebody cuts me off in traffic. Anybody else like that? Okay, thank you. I feel a little bit better. And man, I got to lay myself back down on the altar. Man, God, forgive me and help me figure this thing out. I want to be a living sacrifice. But there's this challenge that God gives that, that he calls us to think about our life in a new way, to not just let it be this one-time decision that we made back when we were eight years old in, in kids' church somewhere where I prayed this prayer, but the fact that our relationship with him is meant to be a living thing that happens every day. And that living thing happens every day means I'm going to have to lay down what I want sometimes and sacrifice for what he wants because I am not my own. I've been bought with a price. And so he's introducing this idea, I think, for some in the Roman culture, for some in the Jewish culture even, this idea of a living sacrifice is something new and fresh, but we've been called to be a living sacrifice for him. It's a fresh perspective from Jesus. And so how do we begin to be a living sacrifice? It's not conforming to the pattern of this world. See, that, that pattern is, is, think of it like this way. How many of you guys like to eat cookies? Where's my kids at in here? Yes. How many of you guys have kids, moms and dads or grandmas and grandpas that make like gingerbread cookies or sugar cookies that were in the shape of like people or Christmas trees or all those fun things, right? That there's this pattern, this mold that is used to cut something out and shape it in. But the reality is, man, there's a pattern or a mold that the enemy is trying to squeeze us into that God never intended us to be. That there's this pattern or mold that, that he's trying to press into our life and get us to fit into something that God never designed us to fit into. And, and in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he literally says that, that in describing this, 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, whose minds the God of this age is blinded, who do not believe lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. What does the enemy want to do? Whose minds the God of this age is blinded. The enemy wants to blind us in our minds. And that's why God wants to renew our minds. Because where the enemy is trying to blind, God is trying to bring sight. See, we, we think about this thing that's called blind spots. You know the funny thing about a blind spot? You don't know where it is because it's your blind spot. And we need somebody else to point out that blind spot, don't we? And some of us are married to the right people that kind of enjoy pointing out our blind spots, right? <laughs> I know. It's like, oh, and some of you kids are really great at pointing out mom and dad's blind spots, right? <laughs> oh. But the reality is, in this moment, God wants to shine a light into some spots. Maybe we talk about blind spots, but the reality is, I think we have some blind thoughts. <laughs> that, that we have bought into a thought pattern from the enemy of this world that is not a thought pattern that comes from the kingdom of God. And when we choose to believe that thought pattern and we think about it often enough and we keep taking it over and over in our minds, I think for a lot of us, myself included, we have some blind thoughts. Some thoughts that have become so ingrained in the way that we think that it happens without us even having to think about it. And we've started to believe some things about who God is or who we are that are not God's thoughts for us. They're the enemies because he's blinding us in our minds and God wants to renew our minds. You know what that renew, that word R-E, re and new. That R-E is literally to do something repetitively, to do it over and over again, to renew our minds. That means, guess what? We're going to have to renew our minds over and over and over again. 
Because, man, there are so many things that try to bombard us in this life, in this world, so many channels of communication, so many channels of information, so many channels of input that we expose ourselves to that there is a reason that we need to renew our minds. Because there's so many places the enemy is trying to blind us in our minds. And God is trying to challenge us to recognize the thought patterns in our life. Recognize the ones that are not from him and, and learn to renew them and build them in the mold that he wants us to be in. And the hard part about that is for many of us, we can't pick that out on our own. We have blind spots and blind thoughts that we need somebody to help us with, which is why we need community. Because there are people that we engage with and interact with that see things inside of me, and it's like, ooh, wait a minute, Jason. Man, I don't know if you recognize you're doing this, but, or hey, man, that's kind of dangerous. I don't know if you want to go there. You should probably think twice about that. That somewhere along the way, we, we open our life up to God through his word and through his Holy Spirit that wants to speak to us and show us those blind spots and blind thoughts so that he can help us see what we might not see on our own and then be willing to take those to him and reshape them around what he wants. That there are these blind spots and thoughts because they're not built around the kingdom of God and what he wants. It's a fresh perspective because we've been doing this study on the Sermon of the Mount, right? And, and where we landed before we kind of got into this Christmas season was, was the Lord's Prayer. And, and in the middle of the Lord's Prayer, he said, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. See, if we want kingdom action to come out of our life, then we've got to make sure we've got kingdom thoughts driving the action of our life. And that's why Jesus would stop and say, we need to pray your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, because it's not the destination of heaven that he's just waiting to invade our life with. He wants the kingdom of heaven to invade our life here on earth right now. But that's a fresh thought pattern for some of us, because we think I'm just sitting here waiting to make it to heaven and figure things out. And God's like, no, no, no. I, I want to get you there, but I want my kingdom to invade earth right now and impact your life in the here and now and not just wait one day for me to rescue you. And that's why we need our thoughts renewed now. Because heaven isn't the destination. It is a place we're going to go, but Jesus wants to take that journey with us all the way there. And for some of us, that's a fresh thought and a fresh perspective. And we get so caught up in life and all of the things that are happening to us and through us and around us that we never stop and think about where is God at right now in the middle of all of this. And we lose the perspective because our minds and our thoughts are chasing other things instead of chasing kingdom things. So how do we, how do we get there? How do we get our life lined up and get that fresh perspective we renew our thought patterns. We renew them because why? You can't get a fresh perspective in old thoughts. I'll say that one more time if you're taking notes. You can't get a fresh perspective with old thoughts. Having a fresh perspective is born out of fresh thoughts. And scripture supports this idea, Matthew chapter 9, verse 17, where he's talking about old wine and new wineskins. He says, they do not put new wine into old wine skins, or else the wineskins break and the wine is spilled and the wineskins are ruined, but they put new wine into new wineskins and both are preserved. Why? Why put new wine into new wineskins? Because the old can't handle the new. The old wineskins cannot expand and grow with the new that's been putting inside of them. They've lost the ability to do that. They crack and burst and you lose everything you put in. You can't get to the new that God has for you, the new perspective and the new thoughts, trying to package them in the old thought system. Somewhere we've got to invite God into the way that we think to show us where those old thoughts are that are not from him and they are not of him. And say, God, help me think the thoughts that you think. 
about my situation. Help me think the thoughts that you think about myself. Because, man, there's so many voices that we allow into our life. There's so many spaces that speak into our lives. For some of us, there have been voices that have spoken into our life, that have told us that we're not good enough, that we're not smart enough, that you're not strong enough or man enough, that have spoken into your life and said you're a failure, you'll never amount to anything. And those voices are not God's thoughts, but they are old thoughts that your life is boxed in and you can't seem to find a way out of. But that's because that's not who you are. And that's not what God thinks of you. And somewhere along the way, we've, we've got to recognize that old thought pattern that's happening inside of us, that somebody spoke into our life that, that probably didn't understand the weight of the words, that they spoke out of frustration or anger or whatever it was because somebody else had said the same thing to them. But now we've taken it on and it's become the box that blinds us to what God wants for us because we're not thinking God's thoughts for our life. We're thinking somebody else's thoughts that just aren't true that are a lie. I mean, we, we get influenced through the thoughts that we think by everything that we see on social media. Whether you like it or not, that whole machine is built to sell you and influence you on the way that you should think about yourself and the things of this world. And so many times we, we look at that and we compare ourselves to somebody else's highlight reels. We look at what somebody else has and think, man, if I could just have what they had, then maybe I would be somebody. We look at the way somebody else looks and think if my body was just shaped like the way their body is, then maybe somebody else would see value in me. And what you don't realize is that's not even a real body. It's been so airbrushed and touched up and photoshopped that it's not even who they are. And you're comparing yourself to a standard that's not even real a standard that God never created you to hold yourself up against. Some of us, man, the voice that influences us is the one that's inside of our head. I can tell you this, man, there's, there's nobody harder on Jason than Jason. I promise you. You could try your worst, and I promise you I've done better myself with the thoughts that go on inside of his head. With the voices that, that, man, I can still hear at times reminding me that, man, you're stupid. Reminding me, man, you are such a failure. Reminding me that I'm not good enough. But you know what? That's a broken thought pattern that's not from God. And one thing I've learned is, man, this is probably one of the hardest ones for us because we can find a way to justify it the most because we think it's not impacting anybody else but me. But the reality is you can't ever love somebody the way God loves them until you can love you the way God loves you. And you don't understand and realize that, that by the way you diminish and demoralize yourself, you make it so much easier for you to look at somebody else and think the same thing. Because if you don't value yourself the way God values you, how could you ever value somebody else the way God values them? The somewhere we have gotten lost and we want a fresh perspective, but we can't seem to find a way to get unstuck to get it. And maybe it starts by allowing God into the thought processes of our life that begin to shape, to be quite honest with you, Michael used these words the last service, that shape the identity of who we think we are. But can I just tell you right now, you're not a failure. You're not a sum of your past mistakes. You are not ugly. You are not weak. You're a son and daughter of the king who has been 
fearfully and wonderfully made in such a unique way that, that God loves so much that he's never stopped chasing after you. Never. And you're like, wait a minute, that's not the picture of the God I know. Like, man, I've been told that he's angry at me and he's running away from me and he's turned his back on me. Listen, that's the blind thoughts of the enemy because that's not who God is. Because the God I read in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is nothing but pursuing the people that he loves. Pursued you from heaven to earth, pursued you on a cross, pursued you out of the grave because he loves you. And he's not in love with a future perfect version of you. Can we get that? He's in love with you right now. All of the mess, all of the hang-ups, all of the sin, all of the thing in your life right now that you're sitting there running through those thoughts about why God couldn't love you. That's a lie. He loves you. So I want to invite our prayer team to come forward. <clears throat> and we're going to go into this moment of worship because here's what I believe. I believe there are some of us in this room that we need to take a moment, whether it's at the altar or whether it's with one of these prayer partners. And, and you need to come and let somebody pray with you. That, that maybe it would do you some good to talk with somebody about the thoughts that you're struggling with in your mind and, and letting somebody else join you in that struggle and pray over you and speak the life of God into you. <clears throat> Maybe for some of you, man, you just bought into the lie that, that, that my marriage is dead or this relationship is dead or, or I'm just not good enough that God or somebody could use me, but, but the reality is he can. And he breathes life where there is death. He brings hope where there is hopelessness. He brings joy where there is heartache and pain. And he wants that for you today. But I'm convinced it starts by us letting him renew our minds, changing the way that we think. And I believe if we could get God's thoughts for our life, we could get a fresh perspective on what God wants to do in our life in 2022.